This is going to be our first Agile Marketing Roundtable. We have some very smart people here joining us today. Thank you everyone for taking some time to share your story with everybody. And these are the people who are joining us today. I hope I got everybody's titles and companies right here. But uh, we have Alan, Anthony, Deshay, and Steve who are all going to be sharing what they're doing right now, some specifics about their methodologies and their approaches and their teams, what's working and what's not. We're going to start with Alan. Alan, I got your, your photo off LinkedIn here. I hope that's okay. And um, he's using Rally to manage his Agile team right now. And you guys are doing one-week sprints. Is that right? That is correct. Okay. So Alan's going to kick us off, and then we'll hear from Anthony who's been using Agile the longest of any of us, I think, for seven years. And what software are you guys using, Anthony? You've told me, but I can't, I can't recall. We're using LeanKit. Okay. And you're doing one-week sprints as well, aren't you? We are now doing one-week sprints. We used to do two. Yep. Okay. And then we will hear from Deshay, who is using Agile at her agency. And you guys are one-week as well, Deshay? We are, yep, one week sprints. That's what I thought. And then we will finish up with Steve, who is working in an agile organization already and then kind of transforming their you guys' marketing. I don't know what sprint length are you guys using? We're at two weeks. We're actually really blending Kanban with a more of a scrum cadence around planning uh, demo retro the, the normal scrum, but we're, we're really running Kanban, generally speaking. Very cool. And I'm sure you guys are using Rally to manage that. We are, in fact. <laughs> okay, very CA cool. Technology, uh, Rally is part of CAF, so that's why you see CAF there. But my background is over five years at Rally. Cool. So, and then I just want to encourage anybody who's seeing this recording later on, if you have a story that you want to share, we're going to try to do these roundtables regularly. So please shoot me an email, and I would love to have you join us on the next one. And I think with that, that's all that I wanted to, to talk about quickly, and then we can jump into hearing what Alan has to share. All righty. Let me take control back over of this. I am the marketing director for SWD Urethane, and um, I've had quite a few years of marketing experience, but only one in Agile. But I, I'll tell you that it's really, Agile has really kind of transformed the way that we do marketing, and I will never change ever again. This is kind of the ultimate system, at least uh, the advantages that I've gotten out of it over the last year, and um, just been transform, um, fam, transformative to what we've been doing and being able to accomplish uh, our in our department. Um, SWD Urethane, real quick, is a uh, we're a manufacturing company uh, in the uh, construction world, so we, we make um, a spray foam insulation and products like that um, for building construction. Um, I guess that makes me a little bit different than most people that are currently using agile marketing, which I think you're going to find or have some kind of links or ties back to the software industry where they got introduced to it. but. Um, uh, I was introduced by picking up uh, uh, Jeff Sutherland's book on Scrum is how I got kind of got introduced into it. Um, in addition to being marketing director for SWB Urethane, I'm also on the board of directors for Association for Strategic Planning, and I've been um, helping them and that organization uh, try to grow. One of the things that um, I've been working on lately too is the upper level strategic planning for our company and then how do I then align my department as well as what we're trying to do with agile marketing into that upper level strategy. So we, I've got some really neat things that um, uh, maybe in a later session that I can share about what we're doing with, with how do we um, have alignment between upper level strategy and, um, and agile practices within uh, a department. And so that's some pretty neat stuff on that. Um, real quick, on a background on, on what I wanted to share with this is what we do for my department because one of the things from talking with a lot of people that use Agile marketing is that it seems like their, their focus is really on content creation or, or what I call pre-positioning uh, items. 
And I want to just let everybody know that we run our entire department, everything we possibly do with marketing from research and strategy to pre-positioning, um, sales support items, uh, lead generation, trade shows, things of that nature. Um, we even manage the CRM here within our company, um, as well as other internal stuff that we do. And everything is, is managed through Agile, and we track everything. And, and this right here, this, um, this graph on the right-hand side is a breakdown of um, exactly where our, our time and resources have been spent over the last 12 months of, of our organization. Um, so that might be a little bit different than what other people are doing. Um, again, uh, I got introduced by uh, this book here, Jeff Sutherland's book, um, which I think is a brilliant read if you haven't read it yet on um, you know how to take Agile into um, any kind, type of uh, a department or any anything that you want to uh, introduce a better way of doing project management with. Um, after I read this book, and I read it multiple times, I went out and I wanted to learn more, so I went and I, I signed up for a, a software uh, Scrum Master certification class. So I got my Scrum Master certification. I thought that that class was very helpful. You know, there's a lot of the stuff I had to kind of figure out what's, what's go, what is going to apply and what's not. And then I also recommend, if you haven't seen it yet, there's a really good YouTube video called um, Agile uh, product ownership in a nutshell, and I think that is a, a very good summary of um, the different roles within the Agile framework, so that's a really good video to watch. How we currently use Agile, we have a, a very small team, so I've got, we've got three people, and so I um, both play the role of the product owner and the scrum master for our team. Uh, we use uh, Rally software to manage the process. We do one-week sprints, and we just run them Monday through Friday because I know a lot of the two-week sprints they'll, you know, start or end on a Wednesday, and and it just makes sense if you're doing a one-week sprint. I thought to make it Monday through Friday. We do one hour of planning uh, on Friday mornings for the, the following week, and then we do a 15-minute retrospective um, Friday afternoon for the sprint that we're finishing up. We do a one-month larger time box, um, uh, what what they call in rally as a release. It's either four or five sprints in that month. So some weeks um, uh, or some months will have four, four, week, uh, four weeks, others will have five. And so we just roll it over to, you know, however many, like, um, we're, we just, we're technically in, it's still in our fifth week of um, August um, because um, Friday will be the, the completion of that. So, um, and then we use a burn up chart to visualize if we're on track. Um, uh, and then we do one-hour planning sessions um, during the last spring. In fact, we just got done doing our our uh, uh, monthly planning for this this coming month here just recently. For back backlog backlog grooming um, is typically part of our sprint planning process and one-month release planning to kind of go over you know what are what are some of the backlog items that we need to look at getting rid of, which are some of the ones we need to move in, up in priority. We do daily stand-ups at the end of each day. We felt that that was better than at the beginning, just because at the beginning we got, you know, people are coming in in the morning and the phone's already ringing because we're on Pacific time, but you know, the, uh, we we have customers across um, North America, so we get calls early. So a lot of times we'll come in and there's already urgent messages that need to be returned uh, first thing in the morning. So we we found that at the end of the day it works better, um, and we do size estimating, and so we came up with um, a lot of our our activities that we have to have done are either um, half day or full day, and so we decided that one point would be a half day of work. And then we use both a physical and a digital uh, scrum board. And then benefits of Agile, I always say that there's three things that I think I get out of it. Um, it helps make sure we're doing the right things. It brings accountability to the team by seeing what they are working on. And then it gives us a better idea on how much uh, we can deliver in a given uh, period of time. And then our challenges we're running into, um, best practices they, for marketing don't always line up with um, what they're using in uh, the software world. And so that's one of the, the reasons why I wanted to engage with um, other practitioners out there that are using agile marketing so that we can try to figure out what's, what's some good best practices. Uh, and um, trying to come up with best practices for super small teams. Um, when, we, when we got 
like I said, when you got a, a team of two to three people, sometimes um, your traditional agile becomes a little bit more challenging. So that's it. Any uh, any particular questions that I can answer? I would like to hear a little bit more about how you're structuring your retrospectives. If they're only 15 minutes, I that just seems um, short to me, and I'm just wondering if you like what has what has led to them being so short. I th and that's that's probably a good question. I think a lot of what and part of maybe our, our retrospective is, is also done in the sprint planning. And so maybe there's a little bit of merge of that, of where we try to determine, um, you know, because I always like to ask the question, what was good, uh, what was bad, and what what can we do better are kind of the three questions I like to have answered on any, any kind of debrief or retrospective that we're doing. And, um, uh, I, you know, they're typically about 15 minutes. Um, at, at times they can be more in-depth than that, but... I think a lot of that conversation maybe comes out during our, our sprint planning sessions. One of the things that um, I wasn't spending a lot of time on initially, and that was sprint planning, and, and we were finding we were doing maybe 30-minute sessions, and and when I, when we started forcing ourselves to spend an hour of time, I thought we were getting a lot better results. And so maybe that's something we should do as well here, is, is start looking at how do we um, you know, force, forcing ourselves to uh, try to get better answers to, um, you know, what are we doing good, what are we doing poorly, and how can we do things better? Yeah, I know with my team at, at Survey Gizmo, we would ask different questions every switch it up so that we weren't always using the same uh, way of talking about the sprint, and that that tended to be productive in terms of identifying different areas for improvement. You know, this is Anthony, and I think, too, one of the things that you find is that the challenges in each marketing department are, are so different that you, you have to be, well, frankly, agile, right? So him uh, deciding to roll in together a retrospective and sprint planning would be technically against the rules, but in marketing, I'm like, what rules? So um, it seems like if you're getting results and the team unity and cohesion is there, then what works trumps what the rules say. Yes, that that's fair. I think part of it too is, like I said, that you know one of the reasons why I wanted, um, you know, wanted to have these type of conversations is that are there things that we can be doing better, and to identify those and then try them out. You know, some mm -hmm. I'm I'm of the position, you know, well I'm I'm willing to try anything once and see what kind of results we get from it. So totally. I wanted to, to ask also about um, what had led you, because I, I do this same thing and I think a lot of people do it, have a physical and a digital board and, and why you're doing that and what benefits you are getting from it. Yeah, and that was one of the things that I, I picked up from uh, uh, Jeff Sutherland's book, because he had, uh, you know, in his book he had talked about the benefits of a physical scrum board. And my first initial gut reaction was like, that is so 1980s technology, and that's not who I am. And, and you know, but he, he uh, you know, from reading his book uh, the second time, it was it was almost kind of this thing that said, you know, you need, you need to at least try it to see what kind of results you get. And so um, the thing I love about it is that I think it brings extra accountability because the, the problem with the digital uh, scrum board is that, you know, you close it out and you forget about it, but the physical one is right there in the room, and anybody that walks in that room can see exactly what the team is Thank working you. on, and and I think it does bring a lot more accountability to what, what you know, people are doing within that team, and and so I'm I'm a true believer, you know, I, and like I said, my, my first gut reaction was like, no, I don't want to do this, it's just too old school, and it's, that's not who we are, but I, I'm a you know, a big supporter of uh, physical scrum boards, and and I'm 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 not going to get rid of mine either. In fact, what's funny is that, and people tease me, but I I took scrum to um, I've got a a seven year old and a five year old kid at home, and I I made a scrum board at home for their chores, and they love it. So, um, uh, but anyway, yeah, I, I like physical scrum boards; they're really good. I was going to say we've had the same experience. Uh, unfortunately, I'm in a place now where the teams are are distributed, really almost completely. And so we, we haven't really been able to make the physical scrum board work of late, but but I couldn't agree more. There's something about it, some visceral feel or or, or, you know, or, or the accountability angle, as you say, but it just feels more alive in a way, more real to, to yeah. 
to be able to move the cards yourselves physically. Uh, I, I prefer it. Yeah, and there, there is there, there there's a sense of satisfaction of moving that post-it to the done box. Is there not? <laughs> I can really get that sense of satisfaction. <laughs> It sounds it's crazy, good. but it's good either way to me. I, but I agree with your statement earlier that when someone walks into the room, to me, that's part of the the value of why we do that as well. And this is Anthony that we we believe there's value in someone walking in and asking about what they see. And once they start up, you know, to understand what it is, now they have a chance to digest it. And visualizing the work isn't just about our team seeing the visualization; it's about the organization understanding the visualization of the work because that not only creates accountability, it creates an understanding of what does marketing do all day. Well, it's not just a justification; now it's a value proposition. And to me, that's huge. Yeah, that's Shay, a good way of something. You know. Jumping in there. Yeah, I, we are. You know probably six months into actually using um, JIRA, and we have virtual offices. Um, we have an office in Denver, one in Florida, and one in North Carolina. So um, I, I guess I'm curious, I'm just curious to hear more about why the physical method is uh, beneficial, and if that could be done remotely. Um, since we all work on the same projects. And it, but I do feel some there is some satisfaction with moving the cards, you know, through the different lanes and then moving them to done. And I think that our team values that and like looking at the burn down chart every day is just a highlight <laughs> to see how far we've come. So is there something different in the physical part that we're maybe not seeing with doing it just digitally? Yeah, I mean I think what everybody's been saying is is a good point. Like you have a physical board that people kind of walk past and then they sort of stop and look and they're not going to do that when it's a, a piece of software. Um, and you know, we we had to get very um, uh, succinct in our user story writing as well because it had to fit on a sticky and that kept us from getting uh, overly complicated in what we were doing. Wow. That's impressive or very good handwriting, I'm not sure which. <laughs> All right, well shall we jump into Anthony? Great. So for me, what started the journey was someone showing me something very similar to this, which made me laugh at the time, but it, it also made me cry because I recognized how true it was. And it's the idea of what the expectations are versus the actual deliverables. And I just I found this to be perfect. So I've modified the uh, text over the years to to get closer to what I have learned. But this is this is great. And so when you talked about user stories, Andrea, we we require it. Every story has a user story. Uh, epics, we don't require it. We just say give us the, just, just give us a, you know, the gist of what it's about. We're going to find the detail in the story. Um, but it's been great to define expectations and know that we can hit the target um, and, and everybody can be satisfied because we're explicit in that. I think that that's valuable. So this is humorous, but true. Agile is a way to create not only accountability, but communication. To real two-way communication where we, we can find out what's not working and challenge each other um, in ways that aren't shaming, they're helpful. And then we measure the deliverables. And this is true of any project management um, methodology, but time boxes and agile are the vehicle for delivering the accountability while the group-based estimates are the team's voice. And that's important because I'm going to show some pictures later. I've taken pictures of our, our physical board to denote the changes we've made since February. And what we've had to do is try to figure out how do we more accurately time box so that we can say what the definition of done is for us. And that's been important as well. It's forward thinking. Um, it put it a really high priority of, on your content backlog and looking for what's going to make the organization better and how do we prepare for ways to do that. And it gives a sustainable pace. We used to be two-week sprints. We're now one-week sprints because we found that this was hard to do with the amount of change that's introduced, so we just did one week at a time. And we wanted people to work at an ability where they could do this a lot and not get burned out on the process. It's very much audience-centered. Um, there's a lot of discussion about that in the world. I won't go into details. But um, it's a it's a cool thing for us to always think about what's, what's in it for them, the WIFM principle, as we develop uh, what we do. So, for us, it's create, measure, learn, repeat. So it doesn't matter which system you use. Um, the point is it's agile, so to be you know nimble, fleet, uh, that's the key. And whatever you choose, you're valuing though incremental, fail fast, succeed sooner, team-based work over getting more crap done. I had a boss once who, at the beginning of our uh, very rudimentary sprint planning, would say, "Okay, let's get more, let's get crap done." He'd always end every meeting with, "Let's get crap done," and I'd always say, "Great, is it the right crap?" 
you know, I don't care about working hard. It's great to get stuff done. I just want to know that it's the right stuff. And because we take the time to really plan this work out, it makes for us a pretty huge difference. Um, so the basics of it is we use epics and stories only. Um, we don't do sub-stories. Some people choose to do that. Our software, which is LeanKit here, would do that. Rally does that. Uh, Jira does that. I did Jira before. Um, but the point is we try to keep it really straightforward. And um, so the, the yellow on our, our board is um, epics, and the, in this case, light blue. It's not that color anymore. It's the tasks or what we call stories. And for us, every story has a user story. So we do it this way, and I, this is my modification. It's as a for, I need to so that I'll know it's done when. So because we do things for different people, I might have as a marketer for sales, or I might have as a advertiser for Google AdWords or for tech target or whatever I'm doing. And then I describe basic scope, why we're doing the so that, and then what our definition of, that it aligns with our definition of done. And so for us, this is a way to accomplish it. Uh, Lean Kit has been okay for the money. Um, it's, you know, it's not rally, but it's, uh, it's worked for us well enough that we've been able to make this uh, work and, and get the value of not only making it visible anytime, anywhere, because there's an app and of course a browser base, uh, so you don't have to be in front of the physical board, but it does give us some push notification technology, which is good enough for our small team. So here's an example. Um, uh, as a part of campaign owner for marketing, I need to review the nurturing campaign for new subscribers so that it meets our brand standards, includes our latest key messaging as a verified logic flow and engagement studio, and has been checked for errors. Uh, we use Pardot, so obviously that's what that's about. You know, it's done when the team as a whole has approved it so that I can make it active in Pardot. And that's a basic one, uh, but it gives you the idea of how we approach it. Um, I did mention estimation, and I'm trying to go quick so I don't take too much time here, but one of the things we found is that estimating for us has been difficult, um, and I'll talk about that more, but we've tried using hours, we've tried using t-shirt sizes, we've tried Fibonacci sequence, and now we just measure cards. And the way we make that work is not that different from uh, what Alan talked about, wherein we say all cards need to be chunked up or decomposed to a size that they're all pretty much equal, and if you have a card larger than that, make a couple of cards out of it. Um, and that way, we don't have to worry about this whole estimating thing getting out of control, which was hard for us, and, um, and it allows us to understand it. So our very, very first um, board was on the, the, when I first got here in February was this, and it was ugly, and it served its purpose just fine, because it did the one thing that it's supposed to do, which is it visualized the work. Now here we don't have um, it all broken down beautifully, but it was the first time to have swim lanes and to describe the process of moving something from a backlog all the way to done, so that the team could see and feel that, that sense of accomplishment. By week two, we had moved into the larger office over here and immediately got up with some uh, quarter-inch black tape and made us some lanes, and it worked well. I introduced story cards in three different colors, one for each team member so that we could visualize that work differently, and I introduced the idea of a red card, which we call spikes. Spikes are unplanned work, but that must be done inside a sprint. That's marketing, after all, and I don't get to say no to what happens in the real world, so we just... We, we verify that it is in fact important, we decide how, what that's going to impact, and we choose to do it instead of. This is not 80-hour work weeks, we still work normal hours. In fact, we work right about 40 hours a week and go home and great, have great family time because we value culture. Next thing you'll see is we grew it. So by sprint number four, that's Morgan, one of my guys, um, you'll see that we expanded the ready column. That was in direct correlation to the fact that it, it, we learned that you have to decompose stories more. We have to chunk them up into bite-sized pieces, and so that took more space. So we made a larger ready column, moved on deck to the left, and then ideas got bigger. Um, by sprint number six, Morgan was on vacation, um, so he had nothing on his column, but you'll notice a big thing happened, and that's the ready column became much, much larger. And it's because as we learned about estimating and working together, it became very uh, obvious to us that we needed to have even more decomposing of stories. So we don't get to the point where you do one task and you go move a card five minutes later. It's, it's not like that. It's simply that we broke it into bite-sized chunks because we were getting, well, we're human, we're poor at estimating, but we were really poor at estimating. To get better at that, we decided to chunk up the work, and it really has made a big difference for us. Then you're looking at, this was taken yesterday, um, we're in sprint number 17 right now, and um, so there's Morgan, there's myself, and there's Scrum Master Flash, um, who not pictured as Danielle, one of the other team members, and what we have is us doing our stand-up, what we talked about, what we did, 
what we're working on, what's in our way, and um, and those last 15 minutes max, anything outside of that Scrum Master Flash there gives us a uh, um, a parking lot item, and we have a parking lot of the people that need to stick around after the stand-up to solve those problems, and she's very good about shutting us down. It's great. Um, this is the actual screens from this current sprint I'm looking at right now, plus our backlog. So if you were to look at the whole thing on one screen, it would look like that ginormous mess. Um, and the top is a snapshot a little closer, and then here's an example of one of the user stories and one of the cards specifically, just because I'm a, I'm a visual learner, so I figured showing and telling would be helpful. And then for us, we measure what matters. So I've already said we do due date, weighted uh, value, uh, and then weighted shortest job first, or WSJF. But we measure the planned work, the work that we said at the beginning of the sprint, what has to be done, i.e. due dates. And then that work gets put on the board. We don't try to fill our entire ready column with 40 hours worth of work. Instead, we say what has to be done this week. We chunk up that work and that goes there. Then we pull from the on deck anything once we're done with those things so that we, if we have a backlog of work to do but it's not due but it's valuable, we would do that next. And then the, the tiebreaker is, hey, two of these things are equally valuable. Which one would take less time? Do that. Uh, that's the weighted shortest job first. So we measure the planned work. We take into account unplanned work, which we call spikes, and then we look at lead generating work because one of the things is there is a there is a, a time that we just have to spend just doing administrative or whatever that doesn't lead to leads. So we, we actually track and use um, tagging on each card to say, was it a lead generating card or not? Was it a spike or not, et cetera? And this is um, as of this afternoon, so this is updated. And then tomorrow at the end, we'll, we'll see it. Obviously, you can't, uh, Danielle shows 114% lead gen. That would be impossible. It's because it's still in progress and we haven't finished the sprint. But that's really kind of the idea is we want to measure what's valuable and for us, understanding the difference between what we said we were going to do versus what we got done and how any interrupt worked, um, un inter unplanned interrupt work or spikes affected that is discussion in the retrospective and is taking the leadership so that we can do something about was that important, should we really do that next time. We don't just assume that um, it has to be that way, we try to find a better way. So, Very cool, thank you Anthony. Uh, hey, this is Alan, I, I enjoyed that a lot Anthony, it was very uh, uh, in, informative and you, you do do a lot of things differently than I do and and that I think is uh, what I'm most excited about is not what we do the same but what we do differently I think is where we can have the greatest uh, learning opportunities and um, boy there's just some a lot of neat things that look like you your scrum board looks a little out of control for my taste but uh, uh, nonetheless I, I, I might steal a few ideas from that I do, I do have one question for you. Um, I'm curious on how much of um, is is do you do anything outside of really content creation and, and lead gen activities or yep. is, so you manage that through? Yeah, the whole thing. So we would do um, everything that is obviously inbound lead gen. We use part of that as our content marketing automation software that ties into Salesforce, and we manage all of that. But we also are responsible for trade shows, webinars. Um, documentation, um, uh, resources that are made downloadable, et cetera. We are not responsible for, in this team, corporate marketing, which would, in, our, in the way that's defined here, is pretty much the website, um, larger branding issues, that's handed in the Netherlands. So we, we coordinate with them through two stand-ups a week with that, with that team, um, but we have daily stand-ups on the stuff that's in charge of what we're in charge of, and that's mostly you know, focused around how do we generate leads. I have a question about the uh, the physical board. So you had um, each member of your team had their own sticky color, mm -hmm. and then they have their own lane as well. Is that right? At first, I introduced different colors just to visualize so they could see their work. Even though I never, I never measure, we do capture the data to show what you committed and what you got done. But we only measure the team's output. We're never looking for, hey, what happened with Anthony or Morgan or Dan? We're looking for how did the team do. So it's a the team wins and loses. Um, you know, that's that's really the key. We we did different colors just so I could introduce the concept because it was brand new. Right, right. I was just curious about, it seemed like some of the cards were, were moving, were they moving between lanes or like was somebody's work then Absolutely. being passed off to somebody else? Good, 
Good eye, very good eye. I didn't think anybody would catch that. But that's on purpose, though. So one of the things we're trying to do is not um, not focus on the specialist, but focus on the generalist. Because we're a small team, we wear lots of hats. So it might be that I would um, I'd you know host a webinar one week, and then uh, we'd have one on Thursday that maybe Dan you know would. And if it's on my lane, and it was estimated as you know do work, it, as long as the work gets done, we don't care which person does it. We assign it to people because we're trying to assign what we think we can accomplish, but because it's team-based measurement, we value being able to, to cross-pollinate, and so ultimately it would be ideal, it'll never happen, but it'd be ideal for us to all know how to do everybody's job equally well. That's not the case, but um, but in we try to share work too because we want to move it to the person who's got more free time and um, and who has the availability rather than the person who said that we're going to do it at the beginning of the sprint. Right. Good eye. And I would make the disclaimer, we are, I can tell you, someone said, oh, Anthony, you're an expert in this. I said, well, if I am, and I don't think I am, but if I was, it would be because I can tell you exactly what not to do, right? I, we, we experiment. <laughs> I've learned a ton of what, what doesn't work, and I can point to that. But it, this is all an experiment. And so for me, agile marketing is still so new that we're making up, you know, the rules. I feel like Doc Brown, where we're going, we don't need roads. Um, it's just that it's fun. And so by putting culture first and leveraging a tool that keeps us focused um, and accountable to each other, um, it also develops unity. And to me, uh, that's key. I, I could not, I did not get that with any other project management methodology prior to this. Yeah, this is Steve. I was just going to comment in, on that, but I can, I can wait. I think one of the struggles okay. we've had in a highly, in a highly siloed marketing department, if you will, in, in a much larger company that I'm now part of is trying to break this view of the work being individual. And, and you're right, there are there is specialization. That's why we do have departments to begin with, right? But, but as we formed Agile teams, we, we've really been struggling and trying hard to get our teams to think about each, each feature, if you will, each deliverable, or each story even as the potential domain of anyone, as you said, Anthony, but more so even the potential domain of two or three at a time. Let's, let's go pair on this, on this story, if you will, and, and get it done because that's the most valuable thing we can do. And, and it has definitely been a challenge for us to break that mindset that, hey, this is my work, like, I'm going to represent my work. No, it's not your work, it's the team's work, and let's pick the most valuable things to, to do and do them together. And so that, that's, to me, where the promise land is in, in a lot of ways with, with our Agile movement. Great. So more of a comment than a question. That's, no, that's a very good comment. That's, that's where, like, I, I love almost every single thing about Agile marketing, but when people tell me that I need to partner with someone on something I'm writing, my walls go up, and uh, and that's where where my my barriers are. So it's it's a challenge. So we we're a little different because we're a um, inbound marketing agency. So the challenges that we came were not only getting our team on board with this process, but also our clients. Um, and I'll get into that a bit more, but that's where we're we're coming from. And the reason we um, started with Agile was really to take the perspective that it's really hard to um, have like an annual plan anymore and we found ourselves continually adjusting and adapting and having to um, quote all the time and put out new estimates and it was just getting exhausting for us and our clients. So one of the, the selling points from the client end was to allow some more flexibility and more transparency each month instead of doing a big um, annual plan that was continually changing. Um, and we specialize in B2B and what we call unglamorous industries. And so typically these are not, not boring or uninteresting, but um, you know, more in the tech space or um, compliance space or that sort of thing. And, Interestingly, a lot of these um, people were working with directors of marketing a lot of times or owners, and um, they tend to be a little more black and white. So um, the agile approach was a bit of a sell <laughs> on, you know, even though if you looked back historically, the contracts changed all the time, um, it was a bit of a, an adjustment in mindset for them to understand how how it, the importance and the benefits of having this flexibility each month. Um, and when I say flexibility, um, we, we uh, 
create a points system for each of our clients. So they're allotted a certain number of points during the month. And we decide on strategy at the end of each month um, based on results and decide what to work on the next month, kind of depending on how things are going through the past month. Um, so each month we come to them with a specific plan that they approve, and it's based on their budget and the points that are allotted for them. And I'll show you what that looks like in a second. But how we use Agile is we, we do a daily stand-up, we do weekly sprints for our 31st this, this week. Um, we have a backlog grooming on Monday afternoons where all the managers with me, I'm currently acting as the product owner, um, and we go through, we just pull the cards that needed to be worked on and make sure that capacity is there for that. Um, we do a weekly retro and sprint um, that started the new sprint is every Tuesday morning. And then we do our, our monthly points planning using our master story catalog. So I'm just going to show you what that looks like real quick. Um, it's not pretty, but this is our master story catalog that has pretty much everything that we offer agency. And it's broken out into epics, as you can see, um, with stories underneath it. And this just allows for the monthly uh, points planning to happen more quickly and we can pull in um, the points per month just based on this. And we also have a version that the clients can see so they know we're not making the points up all the time. Uh, it's a condensed version so they don't get the epic layout the same way so it's not needed for them, but they can refer to this even if they're thinking, you know, hey, next month we're thinking about doing an, an ebook. Um, let me see what that how many points that is, and they know their um, their cost per point, so they can budget that way. We have these three different tiers, um, and the we have the steady growth. This is the medium one that's not showing for some reason in the mass growth, and so we we kind of sell it from the very beginning that this is how we operate. Depending on how quickly you want your program to work, that's the level that you would fall into and this is an approximate price point and how much it would cost and that allows us to have the conversation early on that we're an agile inbound marketing agency. <clears throat> there it is. <laughs> um, and then within that selling we usually put together kind of a sample plan for what their level would, would look like and gets them bought in early in the conversation. And we also speak to value points during the um, during the selling, so that corresponds with our um, our points catalog, and just explains that you know we have this inspect and adapt cycle, um, so we collaborate each month on what to do the next month rather than making assumptions or planning a year in ahead, um, and that it's a flexible program, and just the intent here is really to to respond to opportunities and be proactive about new things coming up and, and making decisions based on data rather than assumptions. And then we do provide a link to the deliverable catalog. And it's also, um, going Agile has also allowed us to have more of an accountability from our partners. So while we say, you know, we're going to do these five things for you, we you know, making sure content's delivered on time and giving edits and that sort of thing. Um, we also can put in here now that we'll put a hold on production if we have more than four pieces or awaiting review um, and that we provide monthly advisement and collaboration. And what that's allowed us to do is, you know, in agency world, it's not uncommon for reviews to be really late coming in and then we're stuck trying to scramble and get things wrapped up. We we do not allow their points to roll over each month. So if you know four four pieces are out there and they're not getting um, getting passed through, then we can take their points and put them towards like page optimization or maybe more social or something that doesn't require their engagement if they're having a super busy month. Um, but it's telling them up front that we're going to take that approach if you have a lot of content outstanding to not slow down the results. Um, 
before I get into this, I'll just show you our board. Like, um, so we use Jira, and we have all of our team members in here, and this is what we look at every morning, uh, pull the cards through and decide what needs to be worked on, make sure there's no impediments. I say every morning, this is what we work from all day long. So all day, um, things are coming through the different lanes, and this really like our project management system. And then if there's any, car, any impediments, of course, they're flagged for discussion the next day, which has really helped us on a lot of emailing back and forth and ongoing collaboration that maybe doesn't need to happen immediately. It, let, it reduces those interruptions um, because the team knows that their needs will be met at least by the next morning and also really helps with accountability. So each, you know, you can clearly see what everyone's working on and might be lagging a bit, um, who might be ahead of the game. That's very apparent. And then, so the other benefits are this ability to have a strategic focus on what's working for clients. Um, seems to be a common theme that we're all talking about. In our case, it's clients that um, also can definitely help for the in, internal, I hear. And, you know, that, that just has really had our results are so much better now because we are adapting. Um, instead of just getting, you can get easily stuck in like, we're going to do four blog posts a month, but maybe their traffic's awesome and they don't need four blog posts a month. So we could take those that effort and put it towards like lead generation or something that could help them more. Team accountability of knowing who is working on what. Um, that should say ability to share work. So uh, that was something that you guys were just talking about. Is we we have um, our, on our team we have three dedicated content developers. So if somebody is for some reason stuck, they can quickly pass it to somebody else to get maybe a second eye or some more guidance or just some motivation, um, or if somebody's overburdened for some reason, we can split work up. Uh, even Sometimes we'll even, you know, like I might write a blog post for a client or something if it's too overwhelming and people have too much on their plate. So it allows us to keep our commitment um, without anyone feeling like they have to work 80 hours a week. It's greatly improved our billing because now we can, um, before even saying yes to a request, it's so transparent to say, you know, we're happy to do that. It's going to cost this many points. Um, and we have that conversation at least once a month with every client. It also allows us to bring ideas to the table easier, saying we saw this happen last month, and we think that it would be a great idea to write, you know, a couple extra blog posts this month, and it's going to cost this much. And they're usually much more, it's much easier for them to just say yes at that moment than try to do, like, you know, a separate invoice and an estimate and all that. It's helped a lot with capacity scheduling for our team and also for our team growth. So um, knowing how many points our team is able to complete in a week, our velocity, and um, we watch that pretty closely. And we're, you know, at the moment, I can tell you we're almost at capacity capacity because we've been watching this and it's we actually just hired someone um, this week knowing that our capacity is maxed with the current team that we have and if one more client came on we would be struggling. So it's Deshae, really nice uh, to have that. Desha, you have a presenter view thing pop, popped up on your screen. You might want to click it off. Just a heads up. Uh, there we go. Thank you. Sure. Um, so it's really helped us keep our capacity where it needs to be without struggling or feeling um, you know, overburdened on that end. And then, um, as I mentioned, we have three offices. So it, having the daily stand-ups and daily check-in really helps us stay organized and everyone knows what everyone's working on throughout the day, um, which, is, which is very nice. I would say the challenges we run into, the selling and onboarding of, an, of inbound marketing in itself is is a bit of a stretch from traditional marketing, and then if you add our agile approach on top of it, um, it's, it can be a bit overwhelming for some people. So we are always trying to tweak the delivery on that. Uh, the even bigger challenge was bringing older clients onto this new system. Um, in fact, we lost one client because they just 
thought it was too complex and that we were trying to like swindle them or something. It was very, very strange. We, we were able to do 14 clients pretty successfully, but that one just didn't want to get on board. So um, that, that's been a challenge. Then, then um, getting our points catalog aligned with production. Uh, I've heard, I heard a few of you mentioned that as well. You know, we're doing the best we can um, to know how many points are needed for various projects. And typically, we do a point for each hour, um, two points, two hours, and then four points is half a day. So we kind of switch it over to half a day, and then eight points is a full day of team capacity is the theory behind it. I can tell you it's not perfect, but that's the theory we're trying to aim to. And then um, we're about 30 sprints in, so I think right now everyone's still on board. The excitement's still there, but I would love to hear from anyone who's been doing this longer because I can anticipate it getting kind of redundant and boring after a while to have to stand up every single day and just kind of keep going through this process. So I'm just curious to see if there's ways to avoid that. And then um, since we are at 11 right now, um, we feel like we're just about at the point to have another you know, person and have these daily stand-ups. We are keeping them to 15 minutes and it's working, but it's close. <laughs> it's, it's getting a little close to keep that going. and so. Um, I would be curious to know too, you know, at what point do you, is, what point is too many people on a stand-up too many? And we've got to kind of think of ways to split that up either by clients or, or I don't know the best way to do that yet, but that's on our horizon to figure out. Any questions from mentioned so far? I have one right off the bat. So yet 11 people on one team. Um, I've, I've had multiple teams before and I personally, um, both with virtual teams and local, I found it difficult to manage once I got about eight um, in, in that the coordination and the communication tended to break down uh, because people felt like I don't need to hear 30, 40% of what's going on because it really doesn't affect what I'm doing and they check out. So keeping the team smaller for me has, uh, which I don't have a choice at the moment, but <laughs> but I found when I did have large organizations that that eight was, was too much. Seven's been my max. I'd love to hear how other people are managing that. Yeah, I would, I would say, yeah, I would say uh, seven plus or minus two is probably the optimal size. What do they say? If you can feed your whole team with a large pizza, you don't want it any larger than, than that. <laughs> That's good. Yeah, I like that. <laughs> yeah, I'm starting to feel that a bit. You know, and we also are um, in multiple locations, so of course, when it's their time to speak, people are on on point and know what's going on. But I can see some how it's some glazing happening for um, for some people. Yeah. Each day. So, I do so want to ask seven, eight, it's probably time to split it up sooner it rather. Be, than. It might be something to to take to your team and ask them how they're feeling about it and and what they you know they might have some good ideas that you wouldn't think of. Yep, that's a great idea. We'll add that to our next retro for them to start thinking about. I do want to hear what Stephen has to say about this, but now that you're the third person in a row has found a way to estimate things into chunks that are reasonable rather than like Fibonacci sequence or t-shirt sizes, which you know I've tried in the past. But I'm, I'm very curious about how you feel your estimation works when you do those points, you know, with portions of a day and it's really, you know, it's time-based, which they always tell you not to do, but I'm like, rubbish, it's worked for me before. So um, I am curious if you find chunking it like that is is really effective and would you change it if you could? It seems to be working for us. Um, they were, we used to track hours for the past five years and so we had a pretty good sense of how long things were taking and so we tried to use that historic data to create these, um, these chunks of time. And it, it seems to help the team members plan out their week too. So you know if Justin who's one of our content specialists has um, that 40 points, which is about the max that he would ever have, um, and he can look at 
look at that and he, I see him put in his calendar, you know, he gets two points or two hours more or less to do a blog post and he can schedule it out that way. So that seems to work pretty well. I think the challenge is making sure that it's split up appropriately for each card. So like a blog post might be four points, which is two for him to write it and one for us to optimize it and one for client edits or something like that. Um, so yeah, there's, you know, does it really take a whole point to optimize the post? Possibly not, but then the client edits can take a little, a little longer. So we, we try to just be as realistic as possible, but yeah, that's probably the biggest gap that we have as far as, you know, black and white of, uh, of, of it. Um, but it works for the team. It's just not 100% scientific. Yeah, I, I have a comment. Yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, I was, I was just going to comment. Yeah, you go first. <laughs> okay, I was just, I was just going to comment on that the whole uh, estimating of points. To me, I think it's it's invaluable. Um, it, it's really been able to the to at least give me a good understanding of what we're being able to accomplish. What what I find that's funny is that within um, the Rally software, we can you know take that activity or that user story down to a specific task, and within the task, we can estimate how much time. We are still horrible estimating how much time it's going to take to do tasks, but we we do our, our our point estimation based on either a half day or a full day. You know, a half day is one point, a full day is two points. And then we and then we do the Fibonacci three, five, eight, and then if, if something starts getting beyond five, typically we break it down into what's manageable to to either a one point or two point project, so we can finish it within that sprint. But but to me, it's like we're really good at estimating um, those smaller project sizes, one and two points. But but if you were to ask me, well, how many hours are these specific activities? That's when our whole system blows up. Is when we start to try to actually put a time to, to specific task, and, and we're, we're horrible at that. And one of the one of one of the things I do is we we track employee hours of how many hours that we put in per week, not to see how many hours are make it a game because everybody here's salary, but we we track it and then I, I back it up and say how many points of uh, of work did we complete for that week, and then I can divide it by how many hours we put in to see what our efficiency is running at. And so I use that efficiency rating of, of how many hours does it take for us to complete an activity of, of how good the team is doing and if we're getting faster because I find that our speed really has to do with a lot of how, how many hours the team is putting in versus you know how efficiently we're, we're, we're doing it. So I like tracking that, but when I try to track hours of specific tasks, the, the, the whole system breaks down and we're horrible at doing that. But we're, we got very good at tracking, yeah, is that a half-day project or full-day project or is that going to take two days? And we're really good at that. And, and to me, it's a huge value to uh, a marketing team to be able to know that that answer. Yeah, Alan, and the only color I would add to that, I think I'm with you on that as well as Deshea, is that um, you know, we, we haven't evolved much past uh, just uh, thinking about the number of hours when we're doing our planning to help us uh, more from a capacity point of view. Again, we're doing Kanban, and we're looking more at what are we going to commit to for the next two weeks. And we're using uh, a rough estimate up front, and hours is just where we land it because I think it's the way marketers think about their work more naturally anyway. And we haven't really tried to push it further, but but we do that. And we calculate it up, and we have an understanding also of that person's availability around vacations, big meetings, big events, things like that. And it allows us to commit uh, in a way that we're all comfortable with, it, and we've been able to hit our commitments. And that's without as far as we've taken. But we're using it more on the front end than, than on the back end, if you will. Know, to track and see our progress over time. We haven't gotten to that point yet. All right. Well, we're running up against our hour, so let's let Steve get started on his uh, presentation. Yeah, I was just going to ask you, uh, Andrea, we are actually almost out of time. Do you want me to go through it still? We have time? I think we're okay. Are we going to run out of go to meeting runway, Alan? No, we're good. Okay. Then, yeah, let's, uh, let's hear what Steve has to say, and then we'll shut it down. Okay, perfect, perfect. We were really uh, immersed in, um, at that point in time, i got to get rid of this right here, excuse me. So, yeah, so I, uh, I went to Survey Gizmo, a little a meetup in Boulder, and that was Andrea and team, and really gave a, a view of where we were at at that time. I think that was six months ago. Um, and that was, uh, I think I was with CA, but we were still largely focused more of an independent business unit as Rally and, and a separate acquisition. So, you know, I've been at it about a year. There's my background. I won't re, uh, we'll, um, go through it again. I was in product marketing at the time. I'm actually 
now in a role as an Agile Marketing Program Manager, and I'm, I'm really helping lead the, uh, the overall transformation to an Agile Marketing approach across VA, and it's, it's a big challenge. It's a 350-person corporate marketing department, so I'm very excited about it. Uh, I have my background you know, coming from Raleigh and have been, having been in Agile for you know, five plus years, uh, so this is a fun new challenge for me. And, and I'm going to do a lot of the same things you guys have talked about. How do we apply Agile? And, but now, in a little bit of a different context than the way it was at Rally, which is what this slide speaks to, uh, why we decided to take this on at Rally about a year ago. You see the reasons here. The reasons at FCA are very different. Uh, we are just trying to move faster in a very competitive marketplace. There's a lot of thought leadership in the company now around Agile with the, with the acquisition of Rally. And so our R&D department is moving headlong into a full-on transformation. And the next stage of that will be to bring the other parts of the business into an Agile um, world as well so that we can truly start to connect from a full value stream point of view, um, not just uh, product and product development, but connect that with better with sales, with marketing, all the other uh, support functions in, in the company to, to really get value out to market faster. So this is why we did it originally, and the champagne glasses more or less say, you know, we had to drink our own champagne, but we, we knew about Agile and Rally, and um, let's apply it to marketing, and, and definitely learned a lot through that process, which we're now applying here at CA, and again, CA's perspective is a little bit different in that, again, we're, we're trying to, to align better as, as a whole company, but, but also inefficiencies in our marketing department uh, abound because we're very siloed, very department-focused, and a lot of specialists, which is always going to be the case in marketing. But for us, you know, we have a lot of different groups that are not working necessarily together or necessarily together in a cohesive way to, to create value for our customers. So the idea is to go from a bunch of individual uh, contributing athletes to, uh, to teams, teams that are very much in rhythm, working together towards common goals, delivering value together, and therefore delivering value, um, value faster. So um, that's what we're all about. As you guys have already given a number of great examples, and we've experienced this as well, marketing is a different animal. You can't just take, say, by the book or, or scrum by the book and say, here, let's drop this into marketing. It's going to work the same way with the same magic that it, that it had for development teams. There are a lot of different challenges in, in a marketing organization. And so we're learning as we go. Uh, it is, I think, a new art in, in the industry. Uh, there's definitely some good books and some good thought leadership out of there, but it's still in a very emergent stage. So uh, we feel like we're... We're learning a little bit as we go, and again, I appreciate the opportunity to start meeting with other folks applying Agile as well, because I think it'll just go faster if we can all learn from each other. Uh, so um, as we go through this, so as a result, we're running experiments, and, and we're doing this every quarter at the very least, where we're doing retros around not just the work, but retros around how are we applying Agile, what's working for us, what's not. And so we're, uh, we're continually doing this, and uh, we have a number of experiments currently underway, which I'll describe a little bit more as I go through this. Um, uh, we're still debating, and I think Andrea brought this up last time, was uh, do we need a product owner or not? And we keep going back and forth on that. Uh, that's one of the theories being that marketing people are so close to the, to the business that you don't necessarily need a person in a role to help them understand the business need of, of the work that they do to get it. They're, 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 they're customer facing every day. At the same time, there's a leadership element that goes with uh, having a product owner that sometimes it feels like we're missing. So. We're playing around with that role for our teams. Um, we're also, you know, at scale because we are big organizations. So we are taking a lot of scaling agile concepts. I think Safe would popularize that, but you know, Rally's been doing that for years, so we, we fully get it. And one of the fundamentals of a scaled agile approach is a, a quarterly planning, a release planning a, approach. And and in, in the R and D side, you know, they're actually able to create great roadmaps and even great plans that they can commit to for for three months worth of work much harder in marketing because I think it was brought up before. There's, there's, we're in a much more dynamic place and, and we do get a lot of um, uh, you know, urgent needs that, that come in, market opportunities, uh, what have you, problems that we're facing that we need to address uh, on a far faster cadence than quarterly. But, so but you do still have the editorial calendar, right? I mean, it does, that doesn't change. It just, it's, it's not all there is. It's going to be flexed. Yeah, exactly. And we have to have that calendar for budget reasons. But I think the mindset shift around that is, hey, this is our roadmap. This is our roadmap, and we are inspecting and adapting every day. Um, we're planning on a regular cadence as well. So what we, the specifics you see in January, if you will, are not exactly what we're going to have delivered by 
December, but what we will have delivered, we'll have hit all the goals, and we think we'll deliver the most possible value, and, and we'll be measuring that as we go. But we also know that we, we like the sequence and cadence of quarterly planning, but we also need you know we need to add in some, some background refinement as we go. So we're, we're playing around with that idea as a, as a current experiment. Boy, this is a, this is not uncommon in big um, enterprise, but um, aligning with departments and changing the mindset of departments who have department level plans and specific reports that they want that Huge. even within a department look a little look a lot alike, right? Let alone a lot of overlap, right? So we were trying to shift to um, to fewer of those for sure, and getting those departments to align with our cadence and also align with the way that we provide visibility into our work. Huge and extremely hard, <laughs> I might add. Uh, so we'll be spending a lot of time on this one, I think. And then uh, somebody brought up the fact, uh, yeah, we talked about it earlier around, you know, the specialization is certainly a part of marketing and a part of the teams we have, but how can we shift to a collective view? I mentioned this earlier myself. And in the process form, what we call T-shaped marketers, folks who are, yes, are specialized and will be the go-to for certain work and certainly your first choice for certain work on a team. But, uh, you know, if the team is have uh, you know, commitments that they need to make that require other folks to pitch in on something, then we want to get to the point where we can do that. And it lifts the organization when everyone has a stronger, broader sense of what marketing is and how to do marketing. And it makes everyone a better marketer as well. So we're starting to see some benefits from that. But it's hard. Again, it's hard to tell someone on a creative team that hey, we want you to, um, well, this is maybe a bad example, but you know, we want you to go conduct a field event for us over in Florida. You know, it's, it's not a real example, but it gives you an idea that it's, a, it's putting people out of their comfort zone and it's taking some time to, to make that stick. So this is where we landed. This is how we're doing it. And again, we're in a very big marketing organization, and so we call it Agile Management, and we're really really trying to introduce Agile in, in this way where we have it at the, at the higher levels of leadership. You know, we're trying to shift them to a strategic and a servant leadership type mindset. Of course they're strategic, but but rather than commanding and controlling and kind of dictating the work, we want them to empower, clear roadblocks, focus on strategy, um, put in place the talent, tools, processes, et cetera, for the teams themselves to be successful. And then from the bottom up, the teams are become empowered. Um, yeah, I think we're making some progress here where they, they really kind of own the problem. They're very much focused on execution, but they also very much own the, the what they're going to do to hit the goals that the organization has. And so we're doing far more than uh, any one area of marketing. We are pure, truly cross-functional. And one of the cool things we've done here, which is really working for us, is we, we've included sales on our team. We have a digital sales manager on each of our teams. And our teams are, are truly cross-functional in that way. So field integrated product and sales. Some teams will also have creative people on it. Some people have a social expert on it. It just depends on what the, what the objectives of that team are. Uh, so they're very much focused on team objectives, team deliverables, and, and uh, sprint execution. On top of that, then, we look across this whole value stream, and we're only focused on marketing right now, marketing value streams, if you will. The one I'm on is, is focused on our Agile management product suite, uh, portfolio management all the way to through uh, the Rally product and, and Agile management um, and solutions that go around it. So we have a, a number of teams supporting all those solutions, and we have a, a, a scrum of scrums or a group level leadership layer on top of that. And, and they're really looking at initiatives, providing vision and context, clearing roadblocks as well, thinking about metrics and things like that. And, and, and in essence, they're the leadership for the team, but again, in a very servant leadership kind of way. Uh, but because we're so big, then we have another layer above that, right? So what's the role of an SVP? And I, I would say that this is one of the things that's actually surprisingly for me going super well. We have a set of uh, senior leaders who are really bought into changing um, how we do do marketing here at CA, and so they're, they're very engaged, and so they're looking at things like strategy alignment. They're clearing big roadblocks, like we have long lead times in purchasing that are really slowing our teams down, right? So we've, we've taken some strong action through our SVP and our senior leadership that to help clear some of those roadblocks. Of course, ultimately, we have a CMO as well, and she's our sponsor, and she's, she's all in on this as well, but ultimately, a lot of our strategy comes, comes through there. So. That's roughly how we're organized. And then our group, and not the teams, the teams fall underneath us, so I'll show you them in a minute. Uh, but this is a story of a quarter now here at CA, and, and again, applying some, some scaled agile concepts. Um, we are on a quarter cycle. That means six two-week sprints with a, a innovation and planning week at the end. Um, but we back up a month from there um, before that even, and we start the process of figuring out what we're going to focus on the next quarter. We, we look at the inputs we have, the, the marketing plan we already have in place. 
uh, we're taking a look at where we're at in our, our pipeline um, of our business needs. We're aligning with our business unit here in the steering process, and we're ultimately uh, coming up with the top priorities from a, an initiative point of view and what our objectives are for the quarter. And at the same time, our teams are also taking a step back and saying, hey, we own the pipeline, let's say for this Agile Central or the Rally product. Where are we at on that? Where, where do we have leaks in our pipeline? Where do we need to focus? As one example. So they're starting to create some ideas for, for what they would want to attack um, for the next quarter. And then we bring it all together in this big room planning event. Um, I don't know if you guys have heard of PI planning in space. We call it big room planning. But it's, this is our one opportunity in a big distributed company to bring all 30 to 40 of us together in a room for a week and really truly get together and plan, but also spend time together and all the team building that comes with that. Um, and so we, we're going to start our second one at CA. We're, gonna, we're doing it in two weeks, actually. And, and we will have everybody in Boulder again. And the company's made that commitment because they're, they're starting to see the value of, of really forming that way. I was going to say so that's a that huge big, commitment and cost for the company, but they obviously see the value in it. That's a, that's a big deal right there. It is a big deal. And, and, but I think they feel the same pain as we do in, in a very distributed company. Teams are hard to even form, right, if people don't really know each other, let alone if they're not really... In a, in a very collaborative way, figuring out what to, to work on together. With leadership in the room, too, I might add, this isn't just the team members. Our, our group leaders are in here, and our senior leaders come to these as well. All right, so they're all in, in lockstep and alignment of what we want to get done. It, it's a powerful ceremony if, if you, and well worth the investment in our experience. So anyway, that's where it all comes together. Right? You take those initiative ideas and the goals for the quarter and the, the ideas from the teams, and you come up with a plan that everyone commits to, and we go off and execute. Again, we're on a scrum cadence, so we, we do our uh, sprint planning at the beginning of each sprint. Uh, we are on that two-week cadence. Uh, we have stand-ups. The teams have stand-ups, and we have a scrum of scrums at that group level two times a week where risks are escalated. New work that comes in is, is the triage, stuff like that. Um, we also have our sprint demo and retro, which is kind of how we wrap up. Um, pretty standard scrum stuff. The new thing we've added is this pipeline review. This is what I mentioned earlier. At the end of every two sprints, we're having the teams also take a step back. And it's not like they're not looking at our performance as we go, but we really are taking this time now to be super thoughtful, at least once a month around, okay, how are things really going? And let's take a look at our, our feature backlog. And are we still planning to do the right things? And let's make some adjustments. And, and so we're going to try this monthly cadence around that for that sort of that in-course, in-quarter correction that we just always have to do because new work comes in or market conditions change or a new competitor flares up. For example, we just had a um, competitor of our PPM product, Planview, get a uh, merge with another competitor of ours, Inatos. So, yeah, it's a pretty big deal, right, when you're trying to compete in a marketplace. And we had to we had to kind of shift gears and, and do some work around, you know, handling that situation. Uh, pretty classic marketing stuff. So, that's probably what's a little bit different than a normal safe cadence or a scrum cadence, but, but uh, I think it's going to work for. Us. But then we wrap up uh, like like you normally would in in a quarter with safe, and that's with a a much bigger retro um, system demo, strong stakeholder support for this. Uh, we do hackathons as well, which is cool. It's for our teams to have a chance to do some innovation on, on ideas, just like our engineers do. Uh, it's a great concept. We give them a data to work on pretty much anything they want. That'll move the needle for us in marketing. And then within that, um, uh, there's probably not, more, not much more to be said here, except uh, the big. You know, we are in the scrum bond sort of uh, state, and and our our big challenge is to Quit looking at the work, as I mentioned, individually, but and, and quit stacking up everything we have on our plate into a, into the discussion. Let's pick the top five or ten items for a sprint and work on those and deliver this incremental value. You guys have probably all heard about work and process or whip limits, and, and boy, it's a simple in concept, but, but hard to put into practice, and, and, and that's certainly where we're struggle, struggling with right now, but it's getting better and, in the whole world. which lane to put them in. What's that? And on which lands to put them in, right? Because it's sometimes it's better to put them um, in certain lands than others. It's it's powerful. Whip flippants are powerful. They're really powerful. Right, but then you get into a world again, like we talked about, where specialists say, "Well, that's great, but I can't work on that. Why would I? You're, you're artificially limiting my progress." The answer is, "No, not really. You know, go ahead and pair and help someone with one of the highest priority items." And, and um, so we're starting to make decisions like that. So what are we doing to shape the success of this? A uh, number of things here. Uh, we're going to run out of time, so I, I, I won't go through these in, in, in detail. But uh, we're still forming somewhat, and, and that's certainly challenged by the fact that 
we merged with CA and there's a lot of people new to it in, in a very distributed environment. Um, we're also engaging teams to take on more ownership. We want to empower them, um, but we that means they also have to take ownership, right? So we're driving them to take responsibility for, hey, you on the customer journey, you should be listening to sales, and they are, right? But it's just that sense of ownership which has been different for a lot of folks in Classic CA. Uh, looking at the metrics around the pipeline, looking for the areas that we just need to go reinforce or invest in, in any given period of time. So spending time engaging them that way. Uh, this roaming of the risks is actually working out really well. I'll show you a quick example when I wrap up how that's going. Getting the leadership level to stop thinking about what exactly the teams are working on and think more about empowering them by clearing roadblocks so they keep that they can be more efficient in their work. Um, initiative planning, group metrics, uh, we are just now putting into place. I'd love to be further along on that, but we're not. So we're going to look at things along these lines. And then uh, we're continuing to get really good about trying to inspect and adapt even at this large level around using techniques like empathy interviews, um, big retros, and NPS, right? One of the, the things we're trying to make sure it happens is that through empowerment, people are motivated, morale is high, and we want to gauge that as, as we go to, to as one of our key success metrics. So what are our challenges? Um, that agile mindset, tough, always tough. I think every organization that tries to go agile has this, and in our case, we're super big, so it's tougher. Um, so that's not just at the leadership level, but it's also at the team level getting folks to kind of change the way they approach their work. Uh, that team forming, team building that I mentioned were highly distributed. Uh, and then there's that whole uh, notion of WIP, not so much within the teams, but our teams are still getting pulled on by their departments to do a lot of stuff outside of these agile teams. And that's, that's creating uh, issues that, again, I alluded to it earlier, that, that we're, we're working on. We haven't really done a great job of finding visibility into our work, even though we have a great tool called Rally. Um, that's one of our goals for next quarter, right? It's, it's one thing to say, hey, leaders, trust us. We're doing the right things, but not be able to show them what we're doing is kind of a problem. So we're, we're going to work on that next. And servant leadership is actually coming along pretty well, I think, overall. I'm actually surprised. The will is there. We just have to continue to coach and teach at the highest levels of our organization what it means to be a leader, leader in an agile world. So the last thing I was going to show you, just a, just a quick peek at our uh, our boards in, in Rally. It's now called Agile Central, by the way. Um, this is our Team Kanban board. Again, we're not in sprints, uh, but we evaluate the work just like you normally would um, each of our quote-unquote sprint planning meetings. And then um, around that, um, we're also trying to build in more experimentation. Um, not really doing it well or doing it much yet, but ultimately you're going to see especially when you think about pipeline and, and trying to deliver good, good, a good lead flow for the organization. You know, what techniques are we using that are working? Which techniques are we not? What messaging are we using that's working, et cetera? And then we want to start to get really good about experimenting with from an optimization point of view. So that's one of the next things that we'll do. And then the last thing I'll show you before I wrap up is this room board that we've created. And I love this. I'm having this is one of the most powerful things we, we've seen so far here today. Is just this opportunity to bring senior leadership into the mix in a very hands-on way to help us become more agile by uh, taking on some of these these really really big problems that we have. And, and the two that I've already mentioned uh, that they're helping with are how do we break through this department level mindset and reporting point of view, and how do we get some of these other sort of um, support organizations aligned to our cadence in our practice and Purchasing procurement is the big one right now that we know we're fighting. So with that, I will wrap up and see if there's any questions. I have, I have a question, uh, Steve. I'm curious that you're the only one on the, the panel today that's on a, a two-week sprint. And that I think the reason I'm on a one-week sprint, I can't speak for the others, but I think is the need to be more agile. And so it's like the shorter the sprint, the more agile you become. And so I felt the two-week is just, it, it just would not work. And so I'm wondering if, if the two-week sprint is working for you because you're a larger size organization, but uh, I'm just curious on your, your thoughts on that. Yeah, it's a really good question, and we, we've really debated that one as well. Um, I think it's working. I, I think the larger issue is, is for us that I've mentioned is, is trying to, to really look much beyond that month. Um, for us, uh, it doesn't mean things don't come up like I, I mentioned, but I think we've got a good process and mindset around handling new work that comes in and just making sure the trade-offs are visible. So we, we're really, really big on commitment. So in that two-week cycle, we feel like that's enough time to take on some bigger things 
and commit to those uh, and actually deliver those. Um, I think that's one of the trade-offs you were making, one week versus two. But knowing full well that that also leaves us exposed if we're potentially find that we're building the wrong things or there's something more right or more important. But, but this film of comes is really working for us. And so we had an example today where something new came up that we were basically able to feed right back and say, fine, we agree that's the priority and here's the two things we're not going to do and then we're pressing on and, and it's fine. So we've adjusted our plan. It's, we adjust our plans mid sprint sometimes for that result. But I wouldn't say that's the norm. I think that's still more the exception. And, Two weeks of the working just fine. The, the bigger challenge for us, again, is trying not to, to think too far ahead and, and figure out, let's say in September, what you're going to be doing in November. That, that's just that's just too far out to, to try to predict. Um, we're going to try to stay with more within a one-month cycle from a, from a backlog commitment point of view. Any other All questions? Right. I, anybody else? If not, then I guess we'll wrap up. Thank you guys so much. This was awesome and I really really appreciate you all making slides and taking the time to to get together today I really appreciate it